I'm going to talk today a bit about fine-tuning arguments and I'm going to assume that we've got a bit of a feel for the Bayesian perspective that he introduced uh, you to yesterday. And then, uh, I, if I have time, I'll turn to uh, another issue that I think is vital to these discussions, uh, in, in some sense, at least from Thea's point of view, which concerns the notion of evidence. Um, okay, so, but let's start with fine-tuning. I should say, I'm not an expert, I'm kind of just making this up. It's a bit impressionistic. I talk, had a chat with a few philosophers and a few cosmologists, and this is just a few initial reactions. I, uh, I don't really have expertise. I want to just begin, though, by expressing a bit of puzzlement and a s suspicion of, uh, of, about some of these discussions. Um, but first, a, a little bit of setup. I'd like to distinguish two sorts of fine tuning hypotheses. And I'm going to call them initial condition fine tuning and gnomic fine tuning. And I think they're floating around in the discussions that I've had. And the, it's quite easy to get an intuitive fix on. Here's what it is to have initial condition fine tuning is hold the laws fixed, uh, and we're talking about fine-tuning for life. There's fine-tuning for diamonds, fine-tuning for cheese, fine-tuning, you know, so there's fine-tuning for this or that phenomena. I'm talking about fine-tuning for life right now. The initial, there's initial condition fine-tuning for life, as I'm said, it's my, my ideology, holding the laws fixed. On average, if you, if you get an initial condition that generates life, how much do you have to tweak the initial conditions to get to ones that don't generate life? Okay? Holding the laws fixed. How much is the ability to produce life ultra-sensitive to, uh, to the initial conditions? So it's, if you're thinking in terms of state space, you can try and make this precise. I mean, roughly speaking, it's the average bubble size of the bubbles in state space that generate life, if you think about it. There's another sort of idea in the vicinity that's a bit different, which is if you had a measure over initial conditions, what proportion of the initial conditions generate life? That's a slightly different idea, because that's sensitive to both bubble size and average bubble size and the number of the bubbles. So, you know, there are a few ideas in the vicinity, but I'll go with the one I said. Ha holding the laws fixed, in general, how much do you have to tweak the initial conditions to go travel from one that uh, produces life to one that doesn't produce life? And I'll say uh, there's initial condition fragility if, in general, small tweaks take you from life to no life, and there's initial condition robustness if, in general, uh, uh, the ability to produce life isn't highly sensitive to the initial conditions. You can typically, you can tweak without going from life to no life. Okay, that's, uh, again, I'm just making it up. This, this is what's helpful to me, okay? Um, there's another idea, which is um, what I'll call gnomic fragility. And I'm going to set that up this way. Hold, fix the initial conditions and take a law that produces life. Suppose we've got some idea of tweaking the laws a lot or a little bit. In general, how much do you have to tweak the law to get to a law that produces, that fails to produce life? Holding fix the initial conditions, assuming the laws produce life, would similar laws also produce life, or would small tweaks in those laws take you from uh, life-producing laws to no life-producing laws? If small tweaks, if holding the initial conditions fixed, uh, small tweaks in the laws take you from life to no life, uh, I mean, again, one can try and make these ideas precise. But, I mean, I don't think they're totally vague, so you get an intuitive fix. Uh, if small tweaks in the laws take you from life to no life, 
uh, I'm going to call that gnomic fragility. And if small tweaks in the laws tend to not make a difference, I'm going to call that gnomic robustness. So we've got uh, uh, robustness and fragility for life with respect to initial conditions, and uh, uh, robustness and fragility for life with respect to laws. And, you know, you can cook up some other ideas, but you get the hang of the sort of ideology I'm working with. Now, I want to think of this in, in, in a Bayesian way, as I said. We all know that um, life, it's uncontroversial that life gives, the, the fact of life gives God a boost. Just like the fact of cheese gives the, the cheese fetish supernatural hypothesis a boost. It might not boost it to anything very high, but it gives it a boost. If, it boosts, if, if, it, if you end up super low, well, it was even lower before. You know? So I'm not saying where it boosts it to, but it gives it a boost. So as I'm thinking about it, we get an initial boost, as it were, with respect to the priors when we discover life. Oh, I'm alive. Wow, that's a boost. Uh, the thing that interests me, at least from a Bayesian perspective, is do various discoveries of fragility and robustness along the two parameters that I've discovered give an increased boost to God, to, to, the, to, the, to the supernatural hypothesis? Is there an increased boost that's generated by either a discovery of fragility with respect to initial conditions, or robustness with respect to initial conditions, or fragility with respect to laws, or robustness with respect to laws. And on this reconstruction, the way a lot of the, the pro-God fine-tuning literature seems to be going is in effect it's saying at least, well, the discovery of gnomic fragility gives God an, ad an additional boost. That's what they seem to be saying when I like, wade through these pages and pages. They seem to be saying that a discovery of gnomic fragility um, gives God an additional boost. And what would that have to be like? What would the priors, as it were, have to be like for a discovery of gnomic fragility to give God an additional boost? Well, we've got our uh, epistemic bar. And I'm going to simplify in various ways. I've got, let's suppose we've got God and naturalism or something. I mean, of course, it's, this is highly simplified. And I don't really care about that ratio. It could be like that or like that in terms of the price. That's, that's, that's not relevant to whether fragility gives an additional boost. There's a chunk. This is permeated by life. This has a sliver in it with life. Because as I'm setting it up, in my simplified model, God's got a life fetish and has the power to generate life. So that part of the state space is more or less permeated by life. So obviously, life gives God a boost because it erases the portion of naturalism uh, in the bar that doesn't have life in it, but doesn't erase any of the, this part. And if, if there are other bits too, that wouldn't matter. But that's basically what's going on. Now I want to ask, does gnomic fragility give an additional boost? To answer that question, and you could ask this for initial conditions fragility, you want to ask how much of this chunk, what proportion of this chunk is taken up by gnomic fragility, and what proportion of this sliver is taken up by gnomic fragility. And for gnomic fragility to boost God, it's got to be the conditional on God, uh, there's a bigger chunk of this, there's, proportionally there's a bigger chunk of this sliver that's taken up by gnomic fragility than there is of that chunk. That's what they've got to be saying from a Bayesian perspective. But what I'm having a hard time seeing is, is getting myself into the perspective where I see well, where that's coming from. I mean, let's look at either side. These are all very tentative. I'm just trying to reconstruct things from a Bayesian perspective and get people to sort of, you know, conditional on God. Let's think about that. How much 
to what extent, conditional on the being a god, do you expect gnomic fragility or gnomic robustness? I mean, it's very hard to think about. I mean, are you thinking it's really likely, really unlikely? I mean, how likely is gnomic fragility conditional on God? You know. And then you've got to ask yourself, how likely is gnomic fragility conditional on naturalism? And the way I get myself puzzled is thinking, well, what, ex what frame of mind am I exactly supposed to be in where I think that gnomic fragility is much more likely on God than it is conditional on uh, life and naturalism? And if it's not much more likely on conditional on God than it is conditional on life and naturalism, then gnomic fragility doesn't provide a boost. So that, that's, uh, this is just a query. <laughs> This is the, the, the frame of mind I'm, I, I'm trying to get you in, where you have to sort of fill in some details. What I want to rule out are some full, false starts. I mean, if you're a naturalist, whether or not there's gnomic fragility or gnomic robustness, you're going to give the same answer to the question, well, where do the laws come from? You're going to say, well, there's no deeper explanation to where the laws come from. They're just there. Whether the laws are fragile with respect to life or robust with respect to life, there isn't going to be some deeper explanation for the laws. There isn't. So it's, you know, either way, I mean, there's going to be a part of this that's life with uh, gnomic fragility. Part of this sliver will be life with gnomic robustness. Either way, you're going to say there's no deeper explanation for why the laws are as they are rather than other logically possible laws, there won't be a, 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 a deeper explanation. So, uh, no, it's, it's just that gnomic fragility gives you laws without any ultimate explanation isn't, doesn't make it particularly surprising in itself on naturalism because even if you've got... Uh, Laws that are robust with regard to life, you'll similarly say there, there's no ex deeper explanation why there are those laws rather than other logically possible laws. So that's how I think about things. And I, I, I'm struggling to get myself into a frame of mind where somehow conditional on God, um, uh, gnomic fragility is much more likely than it is conditional on naturalism plus life. And it's got to be a lot more likely from a Bayesian point of view for the fact of gnomic fragility to give an additional boost. I mean, and you can think about in terms of other... Uh, I mean, note, in general, you're going to expect the laws to be gnomically fragile with regard to something. I mean, if they're gnomically robust with regard to life, they might be gnomically fragile with regard to diamonds. So that they're fragile with regard to some phenomenon is kind of what you'd expect. So there's no huge shock there. So, you know, I, I'd like to ask you the question, you know, if you discover the laws are gnomically fragile with regard to diamonds, does that boost the hypothesis that there's a being with a diamond fetish? I find it really hard to think that somehow that boosts the hypothesis of being with a diamond fetish. And I just can't see system, any systematic reason why fragility for life should boost uh, uh, the hypothesis uh, of uh, being with a life fetish. How do I think about my priors if you're doing it this way? You know, where you have priors, you acquire evidence. From this Bayesian perspective, this is just a way of setting things up in a certain way and asking some questions to sort of probe things a bit. I don't mean to say anything uh, completely um, definitive. Um, one thing I will say is that there, there's at least you know, a danger of something in some of my discussions with people of something quite intellectually disreputable going on. I mean, sometimes you get the feeling that people are doing this. They, they're kind of like, let's do it with fine-tuning, uh, initial condition fine-tuning. You kind of get the feeling that some uh, theists have the following disposition. If they discover that there's initial condition robustness 
uh, where the, the laws uh, will generate life pretty much whatever initial conditions you feed in. Let's super robust and say, wow, look at those laws. They're, they've got a telos to them. Whatever you shove in, it spits out life. So those laws are telically attuned for life. So if they discover uh, initial condition robustness, they give you, uh, uh, they, 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 they talk as if that boosts God via uh, uh, some teleological story. And then, on the other hand, if you discover uh, initial condition fragility, they think that boosts God too. They think, well, uh, look, this, these initial conditions generated life, and if you just tweaked them any other way, you wouldn't have got life. It's a bit of a coinky dink isn't it, that we've got these very initial conditions. So the, they, they then think as if they, they're talking then as if... Uh, uh, the discovery of initial condition fragility also Bruce uh, theism. And, you know, there's something incoherent if they've got both dispositions. If they're, you know, there's no very comfortable way of reconstructing priors in such a way that they can coherently think both the presence and absence of initial condition fragility uh, boosts uh, God. So I think... There doesn't have to be something intellectually res- disrespectable, dis- disreputable going on, but there's at least a danger in discussions of, you know, uh, I, I find that people have these sort of dispositions sometimes, and they're just not being uh, uh, coherent from an epistemic point of view if they're thinking that both the presence and absence of uh, initial condition fragility boosts life, and, and maybe one can... Uh, that it sort of then becomes a kind of uh, post hoc uh, reconstruction that's posturing as some deep epistemic justification. I would like to say a bit next, I mean this is all a bit impressionistic, as to how the fine, this fine tuning stuff to my mind connects to the kind of multiverse reasoning that goes on among cosmologists. Uh, Again, this is super impressionistic because I'm not really clued in very much to cosmology. So, I mean, take it or leave it. I think to get a feel, at least some of what's going on in uh, multiverse epistemology, some, not all. I mean, this is extremely crude and impressionistic and oversimplified. I'd like to contrast um, a Leibnizian aesthetic where the slogan is roughly you don't want uh, mathematically inelegant gaps in reality, and I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to give you some examples to give you a feeling, versus another kind of perspective which makes do with the idea that we don't want mathematically inelegant gaps in potentiality. So I know that sounded sort of neo-Aristotelian, but I'll give you a feel. Uh, Suppose you come across three spheres, and the ratios between the spheres are irrational. You know, there's no... It's it's not like, uh, uh, as it were, one, two, three in units. I mean, the the gap between A and B isn't uh, the same as the gap between B and C, nor is it some cl- clean multiple. It's a mess. Okay? The Leibnizian thinks, uh, well, I don't mind having everything all spheres. I mean, it's all that, that kind of is a nice smooth in, in reality. But I don't want just the, the uh, I just don't want a potpourri of, uh, of masses. I want to round things out by thinking that all the gaps are filled in reality. There aren't these... And then there's mathematical elegance. If you have a vision of reality where every mass is manifested somewhere in reality, then there's nothing, there's nothing, there aren't these weird gaps. Whereas if you just say, well, in reality, there are three sorts of particles. Uh, You know, one is 1.33 times the mass of the other, and then the third is, you know, 2.71 recurring uh, 
uh, the mass of the other, and that's just how it is. The Leibnizian aesthetic is that's a count against the theory. Other things being equal, we should prefer theories that ran things out. The other kind of aesthetic says, no prob if it's like that. So long as the laws permit, or so long as the laws permit the other sizes, if it just so happens that there are those three sizes in, in reality, that's no problem. So long as the laws don't mandate those particular three sizes, that if it happens to break the way that there are just those three sizes, there's nothing particularly bad about that vision of reality or a, a negative. Uh, so long as in potentiality, as it were, um, uh, the other sizes are permitted. So there are the two kinds of perspectives. The Leibnizian perspective and, why well, I didn't give the other one a name. And you can see some of these perspectives, you can play it, play it out in some way, the perspective, at the level of laws. Suppose we have a law that, um, that privileges a certain ratio, a certain irrational ratio between mass and some other quantity. You know, we've got a law saying, well, I, mean, I, I don't want to write down a law. All I'm saying in the abstract is it privileges a certain irrational ratio, the law, between one quantity and another quantity. The Leibnizian perspective is one where, well, that would just be completely unsatisfactory to think that the whole of reality is permeated by a privileging of that particular irrational ratio. It's much better if we ran things out in a way that, well, every ratio has its day in reality. And of course, the multiverse gets you that. So there's, and you know, this is all very crude. And one might have Leibnizian priors, but then, you know, there'll be. Uh, tuned and refined by, you know, discovery and experience. And, you know, I, and I know part of the skill of physics is to exercise suitable judgment in how one deploys these, albeit vague, uh, sort of uh, aesthetics, theory aesthetics, as it were. But one thing at least seems fair to say is that some of what's going on is uh, that there's a tendency towards a Leibnizian aesthetic in some multiverse reasoning over a mere potentiality aesthetic. A, and what I mean by an aesthetic is, in effect, they're manifesting priors that give a certain amount of privileging to, um, to the Leibnizian aesthetic, prefer theories that meet the Leibnizian aesthetic. Now, I think it's interesting. I don't want to criticize the Leibnizian aesthetic. Uh, as I'm seeing it, uh, that's a very interesting way to get to give multiverse hypotheses a boost. But on that way of thinking about, I mean, it, it, it takes a bit of work to connect that in any serious way with this debate. After all, I mean, if I had the Leibniz and aesthetic, I'd like, likely have it conditional on God or naturalism. I mean, conditional on God, I'd have the Leibniz. If I had the Leibniz and aesthetic, I'm likely going to have it conditional on God or naturalism. And if I have it conditional on God or naturalism, then I'm going to prefer multiverse over single universe when I see a, a law that privileges one particular irrational ratio. It's not that, well, I'm happy with just having that law conditional on God, but conditional on naturalism, I want to spread the laws around. If you like the Leibnizian aesthetic, as Leibniz did, you'll want to, you want to let a thousand uh, ratio, <laughs> uh, an, an uncountable number of ratios bloom, as it were, where conditional on God or naturalism. So I think there are interesting epistemic, um, primordial epistemic motivations that lie behind some of the, uh, uh, the pluriverse, multiverse reasoning. But it's on that, this way of thinking about things, the multiverse shouldn't be seen particularly as a useful answer to a fine-tuning argument for God. As I'm seeing it, I'd like to see a cogent way of getting that argument going in the first place. Irrespective of the fine-tuning argument for God, that aesthetic will provide some 
militate somewhat towards multiverses over, uh, over visions of reality where certain uh, irrational ratios are privileged. I mean, it's all oversimplified. But if you see what I mean, I think you shouldn't start thinking of the multiverse as somehow a cool answer to God. As I'm seeing it, it's a cool way of expressing uh, a Leibnizian aesthetic, albeit attuned by experience and theoretical discovery. The, I'd like to, a lot more convincing that there's anything at all to these fine-tuning arguments in the first place. I'd like to, people to do more to help me to get into the perspective, perspective where um, uh, this or that kind of fragility is much more likely uh, conditional on God than it is conditional on naturalism. If it's not, if, until I get into that perspective, uh, I can't uh, find, I can't construct an argument that needs an answer. Okay, so uh, I haven't yet succeeded in really getting into a perspective according to which either uh, initial condition fragility or gnomic fragility somehow gives God an additional boost beyond the fact of life. But uh, I'm, I'm up for uh, being reoriented, but that's, I'm at least telling you where I am right now. Okay. I'm going to switch gears to another topic. I myself think it's pretty crazy to be to have a, a self-conception of one's theism where one's really putting a lot of weight on uh, the uh, conditional unlikelihood of initial condition fragility uh, uh, on naturalism vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, theism. I mean, I think that's pretty wacky. And in fact, there's hardly any theist in the whole wide world uh, who actually proceeds in that way. So, to what extent is the theist doomed to look irrational by the lights of um, Bayesian epistemology? Let me turn to that a bit. Now, of course, one way that they're not going to automatically look ration, irrational by the lights of uh, Bayesian epistemology is if they're priors were heavily tilted towards God. I mean, there's mad dog atheism, there's kind of mad cat theism where, at the, at the extreme where pretty much whatever story you feed about the empirical world, the mad cat theist gives a huge credence to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to supernaturalism. Whatever they see, they think, wow, there's got to be something out there supernatural. That's what the mad cat supernaturalist. What has priors that tilt heavily towards the supernatural, whatever you feed in. And of course, from the point of view of Bayesian epistemology, it would need further discussion whether that um, the mad cat supernaturalist, and there are more attenuated versions, uh, gets to count as... as, as as a rational. If you're a subjective Bayesian, then one's priors are irrational. They're not capable of a rational evaluation. So, so long as you conditionalize, you update by conditionalization, that, that person will be alien to some of us, but isn't, uh, uh, is beyond rational criticism. Uh, you know, that, they, there, are, there are more nuanced uh, priors than that, too. But I think. To my mind, a somewhat more interesting kind of theist who's paying lip service to Bayesianism, and you know, this is one way of reconstructing the positions of, of some of the uh, theist-friendly people that we've heard from a Bayesian point of view, are people that have an expansive conception of evidence. Let's uh, call the kind of evidence that uh, science as an institution will take on board empirical evidence, you know. And, you know, there are 
some constraints on what kind of evidence science is willing to take on board. It's important to science as an institution that one doesn't put forward tendentious evidence, you know. I can't say, well, I saw a mermaid, so, you know, so part of the evidence I want to add to the stock of science is uh, there are mermaids. I can't just throw that in because there are standards for publicity and non-tendentiousness that govern the, uh, the institution and practice of science. Um, but it's a further question whether one does or doesn't have an expansive conception of evidence according to which there may be lots of other evidence that isn't empirical evidence in the sense that I said. Uh, it's just not evidence that's fair game for the institution of science. But of course it would be fair game from the point of view of Bayesian updating. I mean, let's take a little toy example. I mean, suppose I say, well, I've, as one piece of evidence, I have the proposition that uh, there's objective value in the world. So I then do my little Bayesian reconstruction. Well, you know, I have these priors where there's part of, part of my initial bar is has objective value, part has no objective value, and then, oh, guess what? Guess what I learned? I learned there was objective value. I then knocked this out, and that gave God a boost. You know, there's nothing irrational. If, if indeed you get this, the, you know, the negation of that proposition as a piece of evidence, then from a Bayesian point of view, it's perfectly respectable to knock out uh, this part of your epistemic bar and, you know, uh, renormalize in this part of the epistemic bar. And, you know, that's the self-conception. Stuff like that is the self-conception of uh, what's going on in some theists. There's nothing uh, irrational if indeed they are getting the evidence. Now, of course, it's tendentious whether they're getting the evidence, and it might be on, even unlikely on the empirical evidence that they are getting the evidence. But in fact, if they're getting the evidence, they're updating in a completely rational way. In fact, uh, that's, that's what's going on. So I think a lot of theists, at least, have, a self, have an expansive conception of evidence, and they're thinking of themselves as updating in a perfectly rational way, on their evidence, it's just that they have a self-conception according to which the evidence is uh, far richer than the empirical evidence that they've, they've had. Nothing, it's not like they've failed to conditionalize. And I should notice in passing, of course, you might think one, of, one side of the other of these is metaphysically impossible, but we've seen already that, you know, uh, in one's initial uh, priors, it's perfectly okay to have metaphysical impossibilities as live epistemic possibilities. So I'm perfectly aware. I'm not saying these are, there's metaphysical contingency between this and that, just epistemic contingency. And, you know, the, s some theists will have super expansive conceptions of evidence, others somewhat expansive. It depends who you talk to. And for an atheist like Sean, when they encounter theists like this, I think there are, you know, there are a few tacks. One kind of tack is to concede the evidence, uh, that's the, the, the non-empirical evidence that's claimed. And all I mean by non-empirical evidence is not the sort of thing that you would introduce as a piece of evidence in the institution of science. That, that's all I mean by non-empirical. I don't mean to pack too much in. One kind of reaction is to spot the theist, the evidence, but say, well, still, conditional on that evidence, uh, even conditional on that evidence, uh, uh, theism doesn't go very far. So, for example, if someone came along and said, well, my evidence is that there's objective value in the world, one response is, I'll spot you that evidence. I'll grant you there's objective value. I'll grant you that that's a piece of your evidence that you've acquired. Uh, but nevertheless, as uh, my view is, even conditional on that, theism is, uh, has quite low probability. That's one kind of response. That's the concessive response. And the other kind of response is the more high line response, which is, you know, uh, I'm just 
uh, it's, it's of utterly negligible probability from my point of view that uh, uh, you've acquired that piece of evidence. And maybe they even have a conception of evidence according to which it's borderline incoherent that uh, one gets evidence of that sort. You know, so one sort of perspective that militates against an expansive conception of evidence is what I'll call the experiential conception, where the only things that count as evidence are seeming claims. Oh, the seems, it's not a piece of evidence that there's a cup there, it's a piece of evidence that there seems to be a cup there. It's not a piece of evidence that uh, there's objective value, uh, just a piece of evidence that I had an, a, uh, an appearance of objective value. So that's one way of ratcheting down the evidence. If you impose an experiential constraint on evidence, then that's going to delimit the expansive pretensions of many theists. But if you don't have the experiential conception of evidence as, a, as it were a fixed point in the discussion, then it becomes quite a delicate matter which things which propositions are and aren't, as a matter of principle, going to be allowed as potential pieces of evidence? So, you know, I'd recommend that you atheists, when you're talking to theists, reconstruct the theists as having expansive conceptions of evidence. In many cases, they might even be conceding that conditional on the empirical evidence, uh, theism isn't that likely, but they're thinking that nevertheless, Conditional on their evidence, theism isn't very likely. And then the debate, if a debate can proceed at all, uh, it will uh, proceed around whether there's any principled reason to think that, that uh, one could or couldn't have that as evidence. Now, of course, if there's no principled objection to the possibility of that as evidence, then often things will go to a standstill in discussion, in debate, when, uh, when the evidence is tendentious. I mean, if I said to Sean, hey, I, one of my piece of evidence is that, uh, uh, that the uh, reality exists in order that there be value in the world. That's one of my piece of evidence, and I use God to explain that. He's going to think, there's no way you've got that as a piece of your evidence. Absolutely no way. And I say, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry you don't have it. I mean, you're evidential. So from my point of view, he's evidentially impo impoverished. And in fact, from my point of view, he might be a very rational being. You know, he's got this impoverished evidence. No wonder he's an atheist. I mean, who wouldn't be on the kind of impoverished evidence that this guy's got? I mean... Uh, I'd, be, I'd, be a, I'd be an atheist too, I might say, if I had your impoverished evidence. Fortunately, I have an expanded set of evidence, uh, and if, if only you had my evidence, you'd be theist too. So that'll be the theist perspective in the debate. And then uh, uh, Sean's perspective in this debate will be, well, you know, conditional on my evidence, our prior, it doesn't sound like our priors are very different. And conditional on my evidence, uh, theism's unlikely. And in fact, conditional on your evidence, theism's unlikely. It's just you have an illusion of evidence. You are under an illusion in thinking that you have a piece of evidence that in fact you don't have. So one side uh, accuses the other of Bayesian irrationality um, uh, on the basis of an accusation of an illusion of evidence. The other side is happy to say we're both Bayesian rational, but postures uh, by claiming that um, uh, you know one has the the atheist has a much more impoverished evidence set relative to his or her own. So it's even going to be tendentious whether we're both Bayesian rational. From the point of view of the theist, we might both be Bayesian rational. From the point of view of the atheist, only one of us will be Bayesian rational. You know, in, in, in certain, you know, in, in a debate between someone that has a super expansive conception of evidence and the, and say, Sean. And, you know, things will come to an impasse. So we can see what's going on. And I think if there's anything uh, useful to say at all by way of headway, it would be 
by perhaps meditating further on the kinds of evidence, what, what, what's invo what, how we're going to think of evidence in epistemology, what kinds of things are and are not in principle available as evidence, and having done that ground clearing, we can at least understand our impasse uh, even if we can't resolve it. Okay, so they're the two kinds of sets of thoughts that I wanted to throw out there. One is a plea for more reflection on the, uh, uh, the nature of evidence as it relates to Bayesian epistemology, and another a plea to help me get into the frame of mind uh, according to which the fine-tuning arguments are better than they currently look to me. Okay, thank you. <laughs>